He'll never make the things from stray into a real thing. <laughs> I like cute sh I also like video games. I think. We put those two together and you have a fairly unremarkable genre of games that mainly cater to people who put their fingers together to cover their mouth whenever they laugh. <laughs> You know the type. But then there's Stray, a cute cat game looking to break the mold of traditional cat gameplay. And let you just play a 3D cat doing cat stuff. Media outlets everywhere have been praising this game's cat mechanics like it's the second coming of Michael Jackson. And for good reason! Being able to play as a cat who walks on keyboards typing random stuff, knocking things off shelves, that looks fun! That, that looks genuinely fun! And at the very least, it's something different than another indie isometric 2D game about I don't know, unpacking boxes or mental health. This game looks special and has some genuinely special moments. But it's got an issue. Did you spot it yet? It's got stunning graphics, innovative gameplay, a compelling environment, an insane amount of positive reviews on Steam, and it's made by Blue 12, which is a French studio. Oh! Ew. <coughs> Get it out. Get it out of here. I'm joking, of course. I play Chamber. But the main issue with this game is that you cannot find an honest review of this game anywhere. People see Cute Cat, a cyberpunk world, and immediately it's gonna get infinite reddit gold for the rest of its life. And take it from me, as someone who likes cute cats in cyberpunk worlds, even I can tell people are reviewing this game the same way you would rate cold french fries after being starved in the desert for 30 days. Because in Stray, if you take the cat out of this game, you're left with a drunk 5 out of 7 at best which is the same amount of hours it takes to beat the game. Well, duh, if you take the cat out of the cat game, of course it's not gonna be as fun. But see, that's the issue here, because in Stray, playing as the cat has nothing to do with 80% of the stuff going on in this game. And you can tell all the reviews are just focusing on the 20 minutes of cute cat gameplay while conveniently ignoring everything else in the game. So with that said, here's an honest review of the game itself. Stray opens up by showing off some of its impressive cat mechanics, where you get to walk around a starting area and hit the Y button to do some predetermined cat action in the spot where it's allowed, before being treated to a cutscene. <laughs> Afterwards, you get to mob around with your little cat friends in a weirdly out-of-budget looking environment, almost as if it was pulled straight out of Wallpaper Engine. If it's one thing you can't take away from this game, is that it looks... <sighs> Just play the line. Everyone knows it's coming. Breathtaking. It's in this area where the game shows you its surprisingly intuitive controls. And the reason they are so intuitive is because the only controls you have in the game are turn, sprint, and meow. Meow meow n Every other action in this game requires a specific button prompt in a specific area in order for you to carry out this action. You can't just do it whenever. Bad? No. I should not be having to use the Animal Crossing music this early on in the review. Now you're still allowed to do things like jump. If there's a button prompt, that allows you to, in this specific space. Sure, you can drink water. If there's a button prompt, that allows you to, in this specific space. Sure, you can scratch the carpet. If there's a button prompt, that allows you to- Sure, you can scratch trees with the trigger buttons. Ah! The only button I get to press without having to be in a specific spot is the meow button. And that one's great! That one, like, you nailed the meow button. It does exactly what I wanted it to do. We're like one for five here, though. This is by far the game's greatest issue. By assigning the jump to be a contextual action, it completely takes any risk-reward out of the process. If the main part of the game is gonna be the gameplay, you gotta let me do the fucking gameplay. I mean, imagine if Mario 64 pulled this type of shit. I mean, Mario 3D had cats and it managed to pull it off. So what's Stray's excuse? I know I'm being harsh on this, but this takes what could have been a 10 out of 10 game and just dumps it down to a seven at best. As you make your way towards the end of the tutorial, you finally arrive at a rusted pipe that needs to be crossed. This is where the game's first major cutscene happens. And nothing bad happens here at all. The cat makes it safely from one side to the other, the game ends, everyone's good, cats are happy, and the gas prices go back down to normal. Wishful thinking. Instead, we are treated to arguably what is one of the saddest cutscenes I have ever witnessed in a video game. I'm just gonna let it play. E empaths, you've been warned. Cut! Cut the cameras! Oh All right, take five, everyone. Hey, Jim, that was, that was a great last performance. We're like almost there. But do you think we can get like a, like a sadder meow as the cat falls to his death? We've already thrown 13 cats off the roof of this building. We're all out. After the fall, we then see the cat limping alone in a cold waste area, where we venture out into a ghost town with the only signs of life being a few creepy bug things and some security cameras.
This, this is good. Gold star. This is exactly what I want from environmental storytelling. I'm the one that's piecing together that this place has been run down for a very long time, and there's probably no humans living here. I know you don't need to be Einstein to figure those things out, but at least it's not pulling a Ubisoft having the character think to itself, hmm, I wonder what that thing is over there. At least it's not doing that yet. The atmosphere in this whole area is mwah, al dente. And there's even some charming moments where you get to knock a can off the shelf or scratch up a rug or two. But that novelty will quickly wear off, and then it's just back to the quick time events. But without the quick time. Or the events. Speaking of events, this is where the game starts to turn it up a notch, and this is where we're introduced to the... Now listen, I get it. Some people, after a long day of work, just want to turn their brain off by playing a simple game. I totally get that. But there's a reason to go play a video game instead of emptying the dishwasher. Because chores aren't fun. They're fucking chores. And that's what these puzzles feel like. Stray is littered with... <laughs> Littered. Stray is littered with all these small puzzles, and while they could have been great gameplay additions, they end up just feeling like padding to draw out the runtime. For example, there's one section here where you have to jump off from the ground to the balcony, but you can't make the jump, so you roll a barrel over here to jump off of that. Okay, that's a solid idea, but they then proceed to use that same mechanic ten times later. Sure, it was cool the first time, but two times is fucking annoying, no? I love puzzle games. Hell, I grew up on them, but Stray never gives you that aha moment or that feeling of satisfaction when you solve something complex. And right away, I feel like I'm doing the fucking dishes again. The most laughable example of this is in one of the harder puzzles in the game, where you have to punch in a four-digit code on a keypad. Through about two seconds of discovery, you'll probably notice the four big-ass clocks hanging on the wall. And if that wasn't obvious enough for you, you find a clue that says only time will tell. <laughs> the robot just regurgitates it back to you while the big-ass clocks are just behind him. I don't see where you're going with this. This is what way impossible. And when we're not being presented with brain busters like that last one, the remaining puzzles tend to fall into the category of thing is blocking your way, you have to remove thing from blocking your way, and then we're shown a cutscene of that yes indeed the thing is no longer blocking your way. Get ready for about a hundred of those. Now, this is of course expected in any game in the beginning, as it's teaching you the logic of the world. Like in Zelda, you get a new item and a baby-ass puzzle to solve with that same item, before the game makes you feel like a bit of a puzzle piece member for not being able to solve the one in the very next room. <coughs> because, oh yeah, you have multiple items with multiple uses. And that's where the complexity comes in. But in Stray, all you get is a jump and a few extra bag fries in the form of the occasional window blind to open and thing to knock over. There's even a moment where you get a CSI cum light that kills the blob things and okay, now we're getting somewhere, but nope. It just springs an oil leak and breaks 15 minutes later. That's a car joke. A majority of these puzzles are just repeats of prior puzzles. And whenever something new is introduced, it tends to very quickly overstay its welcome. That's fun. That's worn off by now, but still a cool idea. But not only does this mean the puzzles just turn into, oh man, how do I get past these lasers? But these puzzles are just a symptom of a much larger issue, which is the gameplay doesn't evolve into anything. There's no upgrades or enhancements or items to vary up the experience. Well duh, how are you gonna upgrade a cat? First of all, you can have the robot be the one that receives all the upgrades, and two, we're playing as a cat that can understand and complete side quests. Reality isn't the most important thing here. And I'm fine with that. It's, it's okay to have fun in your video games. Elden Ring had a double jumping horse. No one gives a shit. You can have fun. Oh. But then this creates an even bigger issue where there's now no substantial reason for the player to explore the world. Just about every best game ever made has figured out that you need to lace your game world with trinkets and knickknacks to reward discovery. Otherwise, you're just going to be sightseeing, which gets pretty old after 10 minutes. And in straight, half the time you're just going to be met with invisible walls or searching for a necessary item for a very unnecessary feeling fetch quest. But hold on, isn't like a majority of the game just like enjoying the vibe of it? I'm all for having great vibes in a video game, but these are things that are supplemental to the actual gameplay. Especially in a game that's about the gameplay. There are optional things to discover in the form of memory fragments, where this amnesia robot will temporarily remember what a beach or a train station looks like, and that's about as fun as it sounds. And while yes, the short gameplay moments where you have a bag stuck in your head and your controllers become inverted, those things are fantastic. But as a result of all these other gameplay decisions, we're left with a bit of an unsatisfying experience, which leaves the player's motivations to lie specifically within the story. Guided by flickering neon signs, we arrive at a dead scientist's apartment, where his robot assistant meets us, saying he's an uploaded conscious living on the net, but can't recall who he is. Oh, and well, look at that! We're already pretty close to cyberpunk bingo! Afterwards, the robot then loans us his backpack harness, and in traditional cat fashion, he flops over on its side. Aww. It's these short, charming moments that actually make you remember, oh yeah, I'm playing a game as a cat! But then it's, you know, right back to more dialogue. It's clear the robot is trying to fill the shoes and job of the Zelda companion. No, not the good one. 
Ralph from Spy Kids over here will take it upon himself to translate all the speech of the robots, while occasionally pointing out some pretty obvious discoveries. And normally here is where I'd say, hey, like, spoilers from here on out, but for the most part, it's nothing that you're not gonna see coming a mile away. So, I don't know, you, you've been warned. Turns out, this whole city was a shelter from a deadly disease that wiped everybody out. But the cat being alive shows that life is once again sustainable outside, which is great news for all the humans that don't exist. Okay, so far so good. But in an underwhelming reveal by Sir Same Day Delivery over here, it's explained that the NECA Corp created the blobs to eat up all the trash, except oops, the blobs eat everything else too, including robots and cats. This could've been such a rewarding plot point hinted throughout environmental detail as the player pieces it together themselves, but sadly everything is told through us through monologues or excessively long dialogues. However, as we make our way through what looks like modern day Los Angeles, we see these giant ass creepy eyeballs everywhere connected to the blob egg sacs, like it's some sort of hive mind observing us. Up until the point where the robot just explicitly says, Oh, it looks kinda like a hive mind! Thank you, Mr. Ubisoft. Really needed that one. Just taking one look at these things and I feel like a drooling eight-year-old staring at a Snapper Wolf thumbnail. I'm fucking interested! Can't say I know what being a cat has to do with any of it, but who cares? I wanna know more about these things and it would be a damn shame if the writers never explained why there's a hive mind with eyeballs watching us or even mention these things again for the rest of the video game and why do cyberpunk games always pull this shit where they never follow up on the coolest parts of the story? Why? Because it's not such a cool world! So you have a company that created a bacteria to eat the trash that now evolved into a hive mind horror of eyeballs and you just take that whole plot point and just lose it in shipping. How? Why? You were doing so good! Instead, they choose to focus on the robot having this major epiphany that he is not just the scientist's assistant, but the scientist himself. Who the fuck are you, man? Now, you're probably wondering who this scientist is. Yeah, you and me both. I have no, no fucking clue. Once I saw this, I was like, okay, they're gonna make this guy the scientist that worked at the big corporation to create the blob things. Nope, didn't even do that much. Just, 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 just a scientist. The story continues with the cat joining up with these freedom fighter robots who are trying to fight against the 1984 robots, and just like that, I think we've beat Cyberpunk Bingo a couple times here. These bad guy robots were owned by the Nickel Corporation when they were still a thing, but apparently stuck in 1984 mode for some reason. Not really explained well. This whole arc wraps up with you and this outlawed robot fighting the system, ending in this melodramatic go on without me scene where the robot could have definitely in fact gone on with you had it just stood in front of the gate when he closed it instead of behind it. I, I don't get it. This is just contrived drama. It's like this, this, this scene is so stupid. And we scrapped the hive mind eyeballs for this. I just want to play as a cat. Why are we getting wrapped up in this? We finally end up in the beautiful control room that's most likely being rented out by the Kakado Avocado at this point. You know, I sit up here in my tower and watch everyone struggle and be poor. After scratching up some wires, the robot sacrifices himself in order to open the city's biome. The direct sunlight kills all of the blob creatures while also shutting down all of the bad robots. In a somber moment, the cat says farewell to his robot friend before realizing he's a cat and just proceeds to walk outside pretending like nothing ever happened. Sorry to jet, but I'm in a hurry. And as beautiful as all the scenery is, what the fuck? I want to know more about the eyeball hive minds. I want to know what role the scientist guy had to do with all this. I want to know how this cat can go on a mega journey and then act like nothing ever happened after it leaves. I want to know what the outside looks like. But now when we finally get to the big conclusion of the story, it just... I don't know, it feels like a cop-out? And don't get me wrong, you can take a five-hour game that's focused on the story and totally clutch it up with a great ending that justifies its purchase price. It's been done well before, but with an ending that leaves so much up in the air, it starts to leave you with a bit of an unsatisfied feeling. In my professional opinion, which means absolutely nothing. This whole thing reeks of indie developers had a cute idea for a game that wasn't really fleshed out because it was a demo and Sony saw that and said, hey, we'll give you a shit ton of money, but you gotta make a full game out of it and we're gonna sell it for $30. And the indie devs are like, oh shit, we don't really actually have much time to do that, but we gotta try our best anyway. It's the No Man's Sky effect all over again, which is a total bummer because under the right circumstances with the better gameplay and more focused story, this game could have easily been a 10 out of 10 classic but instead is gonna remain a cheap novelty. So if I were you, I'd just go on YouTube, watch some cute cat videos and save yourself 30 bucks. Or invest it wisely into my Patreon and get your name on the wall. Granted, I didn't use the wall very much in this video, but I will in the next one. Thanks for the watch time. If you enjoyed this one, I guarantee you'll enjoy these other ones.